Hello everyone. I apologize for the technical issues that we were dealing with before, and I will make sure to record all of the fundamental lectures that will help you to understand the core concepts. As I was emphasizing in the class, the theme of this course focuses on how the body regulates metals and how that information can impact the functionality of the metal and potentially invoke a therapeutic application for the metal. And so to an extent, we do go beyond the simple application of metals in medicine and look at how metal levels can impact human health. All right, so I want to draw your attention to this particular diagram. To gain a perspective on the importance of elements to human survival, let us focus on the Bertrand diagram as it categorizes elements into the categories of essential, toxic, or therapeutic. This diagram is a classical assessment of the properties of different elements as they relate to their benefit to human health and potential survival. Let us first focus on the profile of an essential element. An essential element, when we look at it from the perspective of the amount present in the body or the dose, with respect to a particular physiologic effect, what we will see is that below a certain concentration threshold, there will simply be not enough of that particular element. So there will be a deficiency. And this deficiency presents a potential health condition that at a very low concentration can lead to death. Then we have the dosage range that produces a beneficial effect. The maximum signal is that signal that your body tries to obtain and essentially maintain what is known as a homeostasis control of the particular element. But then when you go above that optimal level, then you'll see a drop off in terms of the beneficial effect where just like as we observed with too low of a concentration at too high of a concentration, you dip back into a toxic range that can have a detrimental impact on human survival. So it is very important to note that any element, whether they are essential or not, do have the capacity to produce a toxicity within the body. All right, so let's contrast this with something that is therapeutic. Something that is therapeutic at a low concentration has no impact on your body, so there is no deficiency. But then you reach a certain concentration threshold where you do see a beneficial effect. And there is an optimal amount. And then above that optimal amount, you start to get into the toxic range. Now, in contrast, something that is toxic, well, low concentration enough, you don't see any effect. But once you reach a certain threshold, it produces a toxic effect into your body. All right, so this gives us a general overview of how we can think about the value of elements to human health. The issue is that the Bertrand diagram is quite limited, especially with respect to metals. It doesn't take into consideration the oxidation state of the metal, so one could imagine creating a Bertrand diagram as it pertains to different metals at different oxidation states. But even that is kind of tricky. And the reason for this is because metals or metal ions do not exist as free species. All right, what do I actually mean by that? What I mean by that is that the, the metals in the biological system, let's say we're focusing on water as a solvent, you know, as water is the uh, major solvent in biology. Well, the metals does not exist on their own. They are found in interaction with molecules or ions that can actually bind them. And these interactions form complexes or, or compounds. When we're talking about things that can actually bind metals, they are defined as ligands. And the interaction between the metals and the ligands can produce different species that can afford different structural and functional behaviors. and many of these particular behaviors are pH dependent. One of the major themes that we will discuss in this course, especially as it relates to the activity of metals 
uh, in the context of, of metal compounds is their pH dependent speciation. Due to the presence of different or distinct molecular mechanisms in different organisms, metals may be biologically active in some but not all diagrams, or organisms, excuse me. So what I mean by that is an element that might actually be toxic to us could be beneficial to another organism. So you can imagine that veteran diagrams for a given element may be organism specific. I would like to focus on a story um, that concerns the toxicity associated with an element. And here we're going to focus on the Hinkley groundwater contamination case as it's centered on chromium. So this particular story takes place in Hinkley, California, and I actually am going to invoke some amount of pop culture. I actually use um, different uh, real life stories, but often uh, as they they're portrayed in movies to give a perspective of some of the themes that we talk about in this course. All right, so focusing on the periodic table, chromium is a metal located in the transition metal series. Okay, we're actually going to look closely at the periodic table in our subsequent lectures. We are gonna look at some of the fundamental properties that define the elements in the periodic table as it helps us to understand and appreciate metals in biology. All right, so focusing on chromium. What I'm going to do first is to um, show you a few clips from the movie Aaron Brokerage, but also give you a little bit of a background. So this story is about a town in California in which the residents became very suspicious about the number of diseases that were popping up in the people in this town. It was a small community and the potential association between these diseases and the water, the, the drinking water. And so um, Julia Roberts plays Erin Brokerage. She is a real person. Um, at the time, she was playing the, uh, an assistant in a law firm. And she became very interested in the lives of these people and wanted to understand what exactly was going on and why were there so many conditions being found in these people. So here, we're in a scene in which Erin goes to a university to get information with respect to um, metals in this case um, in the drinking water and to try to find out where she can find more information with this specific to the community. Straight up chromium, chromium does all kinds of good things for the body. body. There's chrom 3, which is fairly benign, and then there's chrom 6, hexavalent chromium, which, depending on the amounts, can be very harmful. Harmful how? What would you get? With repeated exposure to toxic levels, God, anything really from chronic headaches and nosebleeds to respiratory disease, liver failure, heart failure, reproductive failure, bone or organ deterioration, plus, of course, any type of cancer. So that stuff, it kills people. Oh, yeah, definitely. Highly toxic, highly carcinogenic. It gets into your DNA, too, so you pass the trouble along your kids. It's very, very bad. Well, what's it used for? Huh. A rust inhibitor. See, the utility plants use these piston engines to compress the gas. The engines get hot, you've got to run water through them. Chromium's in the water to prevent corrosion. Well, how do I find out what kind of chromium they use in Hinkley? Have you been to the water board? Uh-uh. What's that? Every county has one. They keep records of anything water-related within their jurisdiction. You should be able to find something there. County water board. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thanks. Good luck. I wouldn't advertise what you're looking for if I were you. Incriminating records have a way of disappearing when people smell trouble. I don't know that. Thanks. So Erin does find very important information, and she discovers that there is a very high amount of chromium-6 in the drinking water. So she presents this information to the law firm, and now here we see a scene in which they confront the company that is responsible for the seepage of this chromium into the drinking water. Counselors, 
Counselors. Let's be honest here. $20 million is more money than these people have ever dreamed of. Oh, see, now that pisses me off. First of all, since the demur, we have more than 400 plaintiffs in. Let's be honest, we all know there are more out there. They may not be the most sophisticated people, but they do know how to divide, and $20 million isn't shit when you split it between them. Aaron. Second of all, these people don't dream about being rich. They dream about being able to watch their kids swim in a pool without worrying that they'll have to have a hysterectomy at the age of 20, like Rosa Diaz, a client of ours, or have their spine deteriorate like Stan Bloom, another client of ours. So before you come back here with another lame-ass offer, I want you to think real hard about what your spine is worth, Mr. Walker. Or what you might expect someone to pay you for your uterus, Miss Sanchez. Then you take out your calculator and you multiply that number by a hundred. Anything less than that is a waste of our time. By the way, we had that water brought in special for you folks. It came from Well and Hinkley. <laughs> So let's go into the details of this story. All right, so we're focusing on the contamination of chromium in the Hinkley groundwater. So the federal limit for chromium drinking water is 0.1 mg per liter or 100 ppb. So when we're talking about that chromium, we're not really specifying in terms of the oxidation state. So we're talking here a mixture of chromium-3 and chromium-6. I'm mentioning these oxidation states because later in the course you will see chromium-3 actually has some really interesting properties. Um, you know, with respect to what we will discover about chromium-6. Right? So in California, the state limit is 50 ppb in accordance with the original mandate by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, or the EPA. The EPA has since changed to the federal level. So between 1952 and 1966, this company, Pacific Gas and Electric, or PG&E, as it is abbreviated, well, they were using chromium-6 as an antioxidant, all right? So it was actually helping to prevent the corrosion of the system, all right? So it was using the cooling tower water. Well, what happened is that this material is much more reactive than thought, so it wasn't inert. So the wastewater from the cooling towers was actually being discharged to unlined ponds in the site. So basically, because those ponds were not protected, that led to water being seeped into the groundwater. And this resulted in the chromium-6 pollution and the levels of the chromium reaching as high as 580 ppb in the town of Hinkley, California. Now, the company was well aware of this. In fact, they were well aware of this before people were suspicious of the water. And so what they did was something sneaky. They tried to um, clean up this pollution, right? That part isn't the bad part. The, the, what is bad is that they try to do this in a way as if they were not at fault. So they were buying up the property in the local community. So they were pretending that they had an incentive to try to um, renovate the, the community. So that was the reason why they were doing it. And they were even offering to pay for medical services um, provided to the people and services that were basically saying that the people were generally okay. The problem was that the townspeople became very suspicious because there were a lot of people getting sick and many thought this had something to do with the, the water. So one resident um, went to the law office of Edward Macy and basically brought this issue. And so it was Aaron who took a great interest in really trying to understand what was the correlation between the chromium-6 contamination and also the number of cancer number cases that were um, developing in other uh, degenerative diseases. And so the information that she found and really the number of people that were dramatically affected and many with more than one um, disease led to uh, a case being developed by uh, the Office of, of Masery against the PG&E. And so this led to um, the case being settled by arbitration, right? So this didn't actually go before a jury. It led to uh, the defendants receiving an award of $333 million, 
which is the largest settlement ever paid in a direct action lawsuit in U.S. history. So that's actually something that's very significant. So some of the effects of this is that there was a cleanup of the, um, the chromium, and in 2014, California issued a maximum concentration of chromium of 10 parts per billion. I'm actually going to return to this topic, but I just wanted to present to you this situation where there is a toxicity associated with the, um, in this case, with a particular metal, and how that, in, that can impact uh, a community of people, um, and really how efforts are made to try to address and potentially resolve these issues. And something that we are seeing even today, where contamination by metals in water um, is something that continues to be a problem. Cases like the groundwater contamination in Hinkley really puts a negative perspective about metals. And metals actually have a bad rap as being seen as toxic agents. Um, and this perspective has tainted their incorporation in biomedical applications. So you have this debate of organic versus inorganic drugs and inorganic somehow being something that is not natural and therefore something that potentially could be a poison. So you have this kind of weird misconceptions about metals. The reality is that metals have always played a role in medicine. Now, medicinal inorganic chemistry is formally a young discipline within the medicinal chemistry fields. But in practice, this is not actually, actually accurate. Metals have long been used in the treatment of human conditions. For instance, silver was used to treat wounds and ulcers by the Greek physician Hippocrates. In China, thousands of years ago, they used to use gold to treat diseases. And even then, they recognized some of the uh, interesting properties of gold as an anti-inflammatory agent. The number of metal-based therapeutics that have received U.S. Food and Drug Administration or FDA approval is limited, and this may be due to a lack of interest of pharmaceutical companies in inorganic compounds. But there has been a resonance in the incorporation of metals for clinical applications, and much of this stemmed from the serendipitous discovery of the cytotoxic property of cisplatin. Serendipitous means surprise, cytotoxic means the ability to kill cells. Well, cisplatin is a platinum 2 based compound. And the discovery of this particular compound revolutionized the medical field. And it actually catalyzed interest in exploring other metals in terms of their therapeutic applications. So the history of cisplatin is quite interesting. I actually, we are going to talk about it just very briefly. A study was being done to explore the replication of bacteria, and they were wanting to look at the application of an electric field, so they were using platinum-based electrodes for the study. Well, as it turns out, in solution, a platinum compound was forming that was interfering with the replication of the bacteria, and the people became very interested in, in the possibility of whatever was forming in solution having an impact on mammalian cells. And so that led to the thinking about the potential anti-cancer properties of that compound, which was later to be discovered to be cisplatin. We will talk about more of this as we progress. Several metal compounds have been developed as medical agents, but they typically have displayed severe side effects, which has added to that general prejudice against their incorporation um, in the pharmaceutical field or even in drug development. But I would argue that a lot of this has to do with a poor understanding of what is the aqueous speciation of metal compounds. And so basically that means is how these particular compounds behave in solution and how they exist in terms of their uh, interactions with bi biomolecules. All right, so again, we will talk about speciation because it is really important to understand metal regulation as it pertains to the transport and utility of the metals and potential toxicity. Today, different administration regimens, improved formulations, and identification of clear targets have enabled researchers to significantly decrease the side effects of different metal compounds. And so today, 
the platinum drugs, and so this is actually going beyond cisplatin, are used in between 50 to 70 percent of cancer treatment regimens. So that's actually quite significant. Here I present to you a number of metal-based drugs that are available in the clinical market. So here above we see the um, family of platinum compounds, so the parent compound cisplatin. So let's put on our pointer, so the parent compound cisplatin. And then the next generation platinum compounds, carboplatin, netoplatin, oxaliplatin. There are additional platinum compounds that are used globally, but these are the ones that are um, approved in the United States. There are a number of gold compounds of which the uh, compound oranofen is the parent compound. Uh, these are used for anti-arthritis applications, and so this has to do to an extent um, due to the inflammatory or anti-inflammatory properties of gold, and we will return to this topic later in the course. And then there are uh, several antimony compounds that are used for um, the treatment of a paroxytic condition, so anti leishmaniasis So before we dive into the potential applications of metal-based compounds, I just want to give us an overview of the perspective of drug development from discovery to the clinic and the bureaucratic steps that are involved. But I will say that this past year, dealing with the pandemic and the uh, attempts by different researchers to really provide some remedy to the situation has really broken through some of these bureaucratic steps. So part of this is the reason why people are quite hesitant to, let's say, uh, the vaccines that are now being offered to people because we're more used to things going very slowly. And so this sudden discovery and even administration of a, of a vaccine draws attention and actually draws caution. I want to draw your attention to an, the story of a virus, the human immunodeficiency virus, as it has parallels to the SARS-CoV-2 virus that we're dealing with today. And so we're dealing with both of these viruses today. But you see that there is a quite a big difference in terms of the response. And so even then, there was a lot of controversy in terms of how uh, the United States, but even globally, there was a response to this particular outbreak. And so I'm going to focus on a couple of scenes from the movie Dallas Buyers Club, which tells the story of a man that's trying to find ways to provide some aid to people. He's not a doctor, he's just a normal civilian. Um, and so we're going to look at a first scene in which he's actually um, bringing in drugs from Mexico um, illegally. So we're going to look at this scene. Anything to declare? No, nothing. Yeah. And a blessed day to you, sir. Father, pass more, please. <clears throat> Anything to declare? No, sir. Nada. You're a priest. Yes, I am. I'm Richard Barclay from the Food and Drug Administration Office. How can I help you, Mr. Buck? Well, you have over 3,000 pills here. You're only allowed to bring in a 90-day supply. Yes. As I was telling the gentleman earlier, I'm a sick man. I happen to have cancer. I take 33 pills a day. Uh, these are my vials of vitamins. That is a non-toxic protein syrup. This is my 90-day supply. Vitamins. You do realize that importing illegal drugs for sale is a very serious offense. Well, of course it is. As I said, they're not for sale. 
nor are they illegal, merely unapproved. If we get the slightest indication that you're selling these drugs for profit, you could be thrown in jail for a very long time, Father. And to God, I promise to take every single one of these pills myself. My life depends on it. Son. The underlying story here concerns the lack of a strong and immediate U.S. federal response to the outbreak of this disease, in part because this was something that was deemed to be a disease from the homosexual community. It was termed the gay cancer. And as such, there was this prejudice about really even trying to do anything about it. So this is a story of a straight white man. He is not a health professional. And in this scene, he confronts a board of health professionals because from the pharmaceutical company there was an incentive to try to output a drug for profit without really going through the fine steps necessary to make sure the efficacy but also that there was a control of the toxicity of the drug that they're trying to push. I would like to turn it over to my colleague from the CDC to talk about today. Mr. Woodford, would you kindly tell us what you're doing? Oh, I'm just giving people information, Richard, at this trial I'm in, to make sure they know what's going on. And what is going on? Why'd you cut off peptide T, Richard? Huh? Non-toxic drug that I got proof works, and that the National Institute of Mental Health, your own people, say is completely safe. Mr. Woodford, I'm afraid that you are nothing more than a common drug dealer, so if you'll excuse us, we would like... Oh, I'm a drug dealer. Now, you're the fucking drug dealer. I mean, goddamn people are dying. And y'all are all up there afraid that we're going to find an alternative without you. See, the pharma companies pay the FDA to push their product. Oh, come on. I, so fuck no, they don't want to see my research. All right. I don't have enough That's cash enough. in my pocket to make it worth their while. It's enough. That's it right there. I'll tell you what, I'm going to be a pain in your ass if I'm six feet under. Let's go, maybe, son. maybe one day you'll get off your ass and do your fucking job. I need you to leave. Let's go. Here, pass these around, would you? Here, come on, sir, let's go. Don't listen to those cocksuckers. So this is a drug that they were pushing forward, azetothymidine, also known as AZT. So it was originally developed as an anti-cancer agent. However, it was not efficacious in animal studies, and so it did not proceed towards human trials. However, it was observed that the drug had antiretroviral properties, and as a consequence of that, the FDA speed tracked it uh, approval as the first AIDS medication on March 19, 1987. And this was in a record 20 months. So, you know, think about that. And I even think about today when we're talking about the output of, the, of a vaccine for SARS-CoV-2, you know, to help us to combat the severe onset of COVID-19 disease, right? So we're talking about less than a year, and this was 20 months, and these are called, you know, speed tracked. Well, there was much controversy surrounding the drug trials with this compound. Because of the rushed nature of the trials, the reality is that these trials were quite unorganized. There was lack of proper um, standards to compare results. There was even a lack of a control about dosing. And because of that lack of control, there were a lot of fatalities. And there was a lot of unknowns about the side effects and how that can impact people. So here I present to you a workflow that focuses on the development of a drug going from the bench top to the bedside. All right, so that's a common phrase. And so there are many bureaucratic steps and there's a lot of time and effort and capital involved in this process. All right, so we're gonna go through these different steps and this is um, a figure that is from our course textbook. All right, so 
we can think about this as hurdles for drug development because they are. Uh, and because of this, a small percentage of new compounds survive these regulatory hurdles to become approved drugs. And that, to an extent, makes sense, right? Because we don't want to just rush things that are going to hurt people. We already have plenty of examples of poorly done uh, drug trials, the example I just presented to you. And there are horrible examples in Puerto Rico of people getting tested without the precautions being taken. Right? So, in the U.S., the regulatory agency is the FDA, and there are similar agencies for other countries, but not all. So the very first phase is the preclinical phase. So this is one in which one adopts an appropriate in vitro model to test the potential activity of a compound of interest, one that might be a potential drug, therapeutic drug. So for instance, in anti-cancer research, Drug candidates are tested against a variety of different human cancer cell lines. The National Institutes of Health, the division of the National Cancer Institute, actually provides a free screening of compounds against 60 cancer cell lines of different tissue of origin. It is actually a free service, again, I emphasize that, that enables people to get a general understanding of the broad spectrum efficacy of a compound. So, the most promising compounds are then tested against appropriate animal models. So again, if we're following the track of developing something for an anti-cancer application, well then, you try to use a suitable animal model in which you can test a particular type of cancer. So, for instance, you may want to focus on mice. Mice actually can approximate many things related to the human body. And an approach that people take is to implant human tumors into mice, this is known as a xenograft, and that allows for an understanding of the toxicity of the compound, but also understanding of the efficacy and specificity for the given tumor. If the compounds exhibit desired properties in the animal model, then their pharmacology, their formulation, and toxicology are examined. And this information provides a lot of really important knowledge that needs to be evaluated to determine whether or not a particular compound is deemed worthy to move on to the next phase, which the next phase typically would be clinical trials. So what do, they, do these studies reveal? Well, they reveal the best formulation for administration, or at least gives us an approximation of, of what is an optimal formulation. Obviously, this has to be fine-tuned for humans. Also, the most effective dose supply, as a, at least as a starting point, frequency and method of administration, because that can actually have an impact on the efficacy of a compound and how the agent is metabolized. All right, so thinking about this idea of the method administration, well, let's imagine that you're delivering something orally. Well, let's also consider the stability of that given compound. You have to ask yourself, can that compound survive the acidity of the stomach? Because if it cannot survive the acidity of the stomach, then you have to think about a way that you can administrate that compound such that you can bypass that issue. All right. So this idea ties into the metabolism of the compound because you do want a compound to be broken down or and or excreted from the body, but you also want to make sure that this does not happen before it's able to have its effect or reach its target within the body. Once you get the data to support the need for advancing to human clinical trials, then you have to apply for an investigational new drug application, so an IND. The sponsor of the drug candidate, which can be a pharmaceutical company, an academic institution, research institute, and so forth, must file an IND with the FDA. The IND provides the chemical structure of the drug, explanation of how the drug may operate in the body, details of toxic effects in animals, details of, as to where and how clinical trials will be conducted. The sponsor must provide a plan for clinical trials which describes institutions involved. All right, so we're talking about perhaps university researchers that may be involved with the development, but not necessarily the actual administration of the clinical trials, the um, hospitals or other health institute that's going to be working with patients directly, so the number of people to take part in the study, the medical exams to be conducted. 
The Institutional Review Board's IRBs of each of the sites of the trials are composed of health professionals, clergy, and consumers. All right, so often, you do have to have people outside of the given institutions to provide you know, an unbiased opinion. Must evaluate the clinical trial, that's what the board does, and must ensure that people involved in the study will not be exposed to undue risk. All right, so the first phase of clinical trials, phase one, is the shortest of the trials. And this one is specifically focused on human safety. It involves a small number of mostly healthy volunteers who receive the drug and help to determine the side effects of the drugs, reveal how the drug is metabolized and excreted. All right, so give some basic toxicology information. And that will also reveal the amount that the human body can tolerate without inducing uh, a toxic effect or side effects. Then there's phase two. And so here we're moving on beyond the toxicology testing, although in all of these trials, that is definitely a, a, a big component of it. But now we're focusing on efficacy, how effective, how specific even, if possible. So this uh, phase two involves hundreds of patients with a particular condition, compare response of patients to the drug with similar patients receiving an alternative treatment or placebo, usually placebos are used, uh, monitor safety and short-term side effects. And then depending on the results can lead to whether the compound or compounds can move forward to phase three trials. So phase three trials, just like phase two, are focused on efficacy. But these trials are the longest and most expensive as, in, as they involve thousands of people in clinics and health centers. The participants consist of predominantly patients, but some healthy volunteers are included. Uh, that's just to give more information about the, the toxic effects. Okay, there's always an important element. The participants receive the drug candidate, a standard approved drug, or a placebo. So you focus on safety and efficacy. And some of these trials can even be ones focused on combination drug therapy, so more than one drug, and seeing if that can have an enhanced effect or a synergistic effect. And these trials feature very high failure rates, about 50% due to poor pharmacokinetics, lack of absorption, rapid metabolism and or excretion, drug-induced death. Then you have the new drug application, right? So this is after there's a successful completion of all the trials. The NDA is filed, reports on the efficacy and safety information, demonstrates that, um, that, the, that the efficacy outweighs any risk, describes the manufacturing process, and must, ins must ensure relative ease of synthesis, high purity, and high integrity. Okay, And uh, the FDA will evaluate this form. It can take up to a year to do so. All right, so there are additional factors that need to be considered. So when you put this all into perspective, and you really think about the, the multiple checks and balances that have to be done, for a final approval to be offered, we're talking about eight to 10 years, okay? Um, and so even after the trials, you have what are known as uh, the post-clinical trials. So these are basically follow-up trials once it gets administered to the public in general. So the manufacturer of the drug must submit periodic safety updates on the drug to the FDA because not all potential problems are revealed during clinical trials. And in fact, it is in post-clinical trials already admitted to the uh, clinical market, right, where a number of drugs have actually been recalled and are no longer um, manufactured. Information for the updates is provided by physicians who report adverse side effects associated with the drug directly to the FDA using a standard protocol. The identification of new risks can lead to revision of treatment protocols and in a few cases, removal of the drug from the market. So when we're focusing on this in terms of the cost, um, research and development, R&D, in the U.S., a patent lasts 20 to 24 years. So this is basically the uh, intellectual property over the development of the, of the drug, right? So one-third to one-half of this time is consumed in testing the compound, right? So think about how much that person who owns a patent, you know, has rights or intellectual rights over it. 
and how much time is consumed in just the, the, the development, well not the development necessarily, but the actual testing of it in terms of its efficacy. The R&D cost for a single drug is about $1.3 in the U.S. and $1 billion in capitalized cost. All right, so there's lots of money involved here. And it's one of the reasons why in the U.S. drugs are so expensive because they eventually want to turn a profit and, profit and they want to turn a profit quick because a lot of the amount of time um, that a, a patent is, own, is owned is used up in just the development portion of it. The testing portion of it. So there are efforts to try to cut down in terms of the time and even the cost to drug development. So you have efforts being dedicated to repurposing drugs. So repurposing generally refers to studying drugs that are already approved, right? So it's it's toxic effects or it's toxicology in the human body is well understood. So that helps to speed up the process of, of potentially using it to treat other conditions, other diseases. <clears throat> and so here I provide you um, some informa uh, basically information from the NIH. This is the National Cancer for Advancing Translational Sciences, right? Translational means it's taking um, basic research and translating it to an application. Uh, there's a link towards repurposing drugs, so known drugs, and they're being tested for other um, potential applications. So there are several important agencies to inform in diseases and provide research funding to tackle treatment and or diagnosis, the FDA, the Center for Disease Control, CDC, the National Institutes of Health, the NIH, and there are private agencies, I'm just naming two here as a really simple um, set of examples, the American Cancer Society, American Diabetes Society, so as the name implies, they give you know insight into efforts towards the treatment of cancers and diabetes. Right. So with this in mind, now that we have a perspective of what it takes to really get something that does not necessarily have to be metal-based, right, but to get something from basic research, so things that you do in the laboratory environment, and then to actually have a real impact on human health and or, or application to monitor human health, well, I want you to see this background, because that background will, will will inform you on the importance of many of these efforts and the need to really control, you know, where the funding is going in terms of the development of future things that can be vital. So as far as our course, okay, so I am a bioinorganic chemist. I have a lot of interest in understanding how biology regulates metals and how that information can be used for developing metal-based therapeutics. My office is located in Facundo Hueso, room 312. My office hours will be virtual from um, Tuesdays to 4 o'clock, but certainly virtual by appointment. And, or if we have to meet in person for some reason, we, we can certainly arrange to do so. My university email is here, and I've already been in contact with all of you. All right, so here's this big paragraph, right? But you can find this really big paragraph in your syllabus. And it basically gives you an overview of the big picture of this course because I, I find courses are really important in terms of what is it that we're trying to say and you know when we break it down to you know the take home messages well there has to be something that has a real life application at least for me so um, in this course we're going to find the importance of metals in the human biological system and understand how ligands that bind the metals to form metal complexes can regulate the bioactivity of the metals. This course is structured in a seminar style and will focus on the discussion of the scientific literature to understand the role that metals play in, in the body. We are going to use additional media to explore environmental and medical controversies. Um, there will be a few traditional lectures offered by me, you know, so they're more fundamental, but, and also some guest lectures that they're going to provide their expertise for, for us uh, to help provide sufficient fundamental concepts to illuminate all the topics that will be discussed. There will be no exams in the course. Okay, That doesn't mean that you don't have to study or read the material because I would definitely assess your, your comprehension by having you focus on short assignments that will evaluate your understanding of core concepts presented in lectures and research articles. We will all participate in leading topic discussions, so we will all be involved in the development of the course curriculum or the course material, the course knowledge. And so together, we will work on producing a review manuscript, 
And so this review manuscript centers on the biochemical significance and anti-cancer application of cytochrome C. And we're going to look at the importance of the metal in this protein, facilitating the protein's uh, functionality. Okay, so we'll be developing knowledge from, for this review, but also each one of you will be developing knowledge in terms of group presentations that you'll be offering in the form of a seminar. So each one of you will be uh, developing two seminars, and so we'll, we will talk about this uh, in subsequent lectures in terms of administrating this work. All right, so be prepared to read, write, and discuss things openly. Don't be shy. We have a course textbook, which I've provided you guys the links through email. But that's, that is part of the literature that we will use. We'll also depend heavily on research articles. We also have a class website where I will upload the course uh, lectures, the slides, and any associated recordings. So as I mentioned to you, there are, in terms of the format, there are some traditional lectures, PowerPoints, but there will also be um, material that's provided by other colleagues. And in following a student interactive pedagogy, much of the course will involve you, the students, presenting and developing the material. So I'm actually going to be learning alongside with you things that you find and relate to the, the, the themes that we develop in the course. So this is a general overview of the grading scheme. The short assignments account for 30% of your grade. The seminar presentation and corresponding participation corresponds to 30% of your grade. And finally, the course manuscript okay, will be 40% of your grade. So we will talk about this manuscript um, because it will consist of the class being divided into subgroups. Each one will be focusing on a different perspective that we'll bring it together to depict a, a full picture of, in this case, of, of a particular metal-based protein. All right, so returning to the Hinkley groundwater contamination case, so the non-Hollywood ending. Well, what was the Hollywood ending, at least for the Erin Brokerage movie, um, Julia Roberts won an Oscar for Best Actress. And actually not thinking about it, in the Dallas Buyers Club, uh, that movie, Matthew McConaughey won an, an Oscar for Best Actress. I guess I didn't really think about that, um, per, that perspective. But nonetheless, going back to the Hinkley situation, where there is a bit of a question mark about the science involved in the Hinckley case. Because there may not be strong evidence or strong enough evidence to support that chromium-6 ingestion at the concentration levels measured in the Hinckley water could have led to the outburst of all the number of cancer cases reported and other diseases by the, the defendants. Um, cancer cases reported in Hinckley were apparently no higher than other similar towns which had not experienced chromium-6 contamination. So that's really interesting. Um, other external factors could have contributed to the success of the case that had nothing to do with the actual contamination. So there are some thoughts that, that perhaps PG&E was dealing with some corruption and so they wanted to just kind of, you know, settle that and so they just chose to settle this, this situation. You know, that's a big question mark. In 2017, California rejected the maximum concentration of chromium of 10 ppb. However, this really had nothing to do with overturning the information that was garnered from this case. Rather, it had to do with something more practical. This was in part due to a lack of economic feasibility. It was just too hard to really get down to those levels of, of chromium in drinking water. But you know, there are a lot of things that remain because the reality is that if you look up Hinkley, California today, it basically has become a ghost town. People have left. Um, uh, many people did die. So these things were very much real. Uh, so it is worth looking into what, what actually did happen here. And if you think about today, there are many examples of water contamination of metals. For instance, um, you can even look to uh, the Flint case that is still being resolved and it is a to an extent, a success story, but one that um, I would say is has some really long-lasting effects. All right, something just to think about. All right, so all right, so I apologize again for not being able to complete this live. Again, technical issues which we will overcome during the semester, and I'm sure that we're going to 
bump into many other ones, and so we'll, we'll deal with this. Um, but I do want to say that if you have any questions, any doubts with regards to the course or the administration of the material, feel free to contact me. I already provide you with my um, email address and uh, office hours availability. You have the course syllabus. All right. So normally when I give this class live, I will present to you that I have some amount of that Hinkley groundwater, right? And so, you know, I, I ask you guys if you want any water to drink. Um, and, you know, I actually don't remember if this actually came from that, so who knows. But anyways, um, it's great meeting everyone today, and I'm hoping for a fantastic semester. So I look forward to learning alongside you. Take care, everyone.